The singing was just beautiful this morning, and we want to thank Brother Chuck Caruso for directing us in that singing. The songs were so uplifting, and uh, I'm sure that all of us feel greatly blessed by having engaged our voices together in the singing of these good songs. Already the lectureship has uh, gotten off to a great start and good has been done. I feel uh, certain about that. Uh, it's just a joy to be here. We appreciate so much the lovely flowers that the Rankin family provided for us. And, and it's just a beautiful day and a wonderful occasion. Brother David Spruill was with us two years ago and did just such an outstanding job that uh, we certainly wanted him back. And we're grateful to have him back at this particular time to speak to us this morning. He's a native Floridian, and he attended Freed Hardeman University, where he received a bachelor's degree in Bible. And he's been preaching the gospel now for 14 years. He served congregations in Tennessee and Florida. He conducts gospel meetings and appears on numerous lectureships throughout the United States and has done so also in four foreign countries. Since 1997, he has worked with the Palm Beach Lakes Garden Congregation in West Palm Beach, Florida, where Brother Dan Jenkins is the preacher. Most all of us have heard Dan on numerous occasions, and we've heard David. And of course, we mentioned that Doug Alvaringa is also working with them. So that congregation has some outstanding gospel preachers working with them there. Uh, his wife's name is Tracy, and they have two daughters, Katie and Kelly. And he's going to be addressing us on this, uh, this morning on the theme, The Ways of the Lord Are Right. And that's based on the uh, 14th chapter of the book of Hosea, verse 9. His assignment is the 12th through the 14th chapter. I know there's a gap there from the lesson we heard Willie Alvaringa uh, bring, but all the chapters will be covered, but uh, in, in the order that we have them listed. David, we're happy to have you with us today. We're looking forward to hearing you. I know that you'll be uh, thrilled to, to hear him bring this message. And we want to stress to all of our minds that indeed the ways of the Lord are right. So good to be back with this good congregation and to have the privilege of worshiping with you and being a part of this great lectureship. I would encourage you, as Brother Alvaringa did in the last hour, to pick up one of the lectureship books and to look at uh, Brother Alvaringa's manuscript and my manuscript, if you don't look at any others. The assigned, the assigned passage for this particular lesson were the last three chapters of the book of Hosea. And in that manuscript, I have tried to deal with those last three chapters, giving a brief, comment, uh, brief comments and commentary on those chapters. But in the synopsis that Brother Maxey sent me about this lesson, he gave me permission, and the word he used, and he had it in quotes, was to sermonize on the topic that's found in Hosea chapter 14 and verse 9. And that's where Hosea says, as he summarizes the end of his book, that the ways of the Lord are right. You may be aware as you turn on the news that halfway around the world there is a war that is going on. But I would suggest to you that there is a war that is going on all over this globe. It's not just a war that's halfway around the world it's a, it, it is a war that each and every one of us is a part of. But it's not a war that you're going to hear about on the news tonight. And it's not a war that you're going to find our presidential candidates talking about. But it's a war that when it's ended, someone will have won your soul. When the war is over, your soul will have been won. The Bible says that God wants every man to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. 
The Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so as you think about this war that is happening all over this globe, and the war that's happening even inside this building this morning, we need to recognize that on the one side, there is the God of heaven who is pulling for us to go to heaven. God has no greater desire for you in your life than for you to go to heaven. If you could know how much God wants you to go to heaven, you'd spend your entire life trying to get there just to please Him. God does not want a single one to perish. And yet, while God is pulling for you in one direction to go to heaven, you know there's somebody pulling in the other direction. And while God does not want you to perish, there is that other, there is that adversary, there is the devil who's walking about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He wants your soul. He doesn't want your soul to go to heaven. He wants your soul to spend all of eternity in the fires of hell. And right now, at this very moment, there's a war. God is pulling in order that you might come to heaven. The devil is pulling in order that you might follow him, follow after his ways, and spend all of eternity in hell. Who's going to win? Who's going to win the battle? Who's going to win that war? Most of the time when you think of a battle, think of a war, think of a tug-of-war contest, you would automatically assume that every time the strongest one is going to win. And I wish that were the case in this situation. Because there's no doubt that God is infinitely stronger than Satan. He who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. But God is not going to win your soul unless you decide that that's where you want to go. God is pulling for you. Satan is pulling against you. Pulling against God. And the decision. The ultimate end of this war is in your hands. And so I stand before you today. And as Joshua stood before the children of Israel, before his death. In Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15, a passage that you know very well. Joshua called upon the people of God. And he said, you need to choose this day whom you will serve. Brother and sister in Christ, every young person who's here today, there's a lot of kids here today. Every friend who's here today, every loved one who's here today, I call upon you, choose you this day whom you will serve. Joshua gave them the options. He said, you can go back and you can serve the gods that your father served over on the other side. You can serve the gods that are right here in this land. But Joshua said, as for me and my house, you know it, we will serve the Lord. Will you not this morning make up your mind? Will you not this morning stop being like some of those prophets of Baal were in 1 Kings chapter 18, where Elijah came along and said, why falter ye between two opinions? Sometimes that's what our life looks like. Sometimes our life looks like we can't make up our mind which direction we want to go. Sometimes our minds can't help us to make up our minds which, which God, which direction are we going to serve. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, No man can serve two masters. Now that's not a reflection on your capability. That's not a reflection on your ability or on your strength. Jesus was saying it is flat impossible for you to serve two masters at the same time. You cannot turn and serve God and be serving Satan at the same time. Jesus says it's impossible. And you cannot turn and be serving Satan and be serving God at the same time. Jesus says it cannot happen. Therefore, choose you today whom you will serve. 
In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus told us about the paths that we can take in this life. And if you want to look in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, or two verses that we will look at this morning, there is this idea today that as people live this life, that they can go, and as it, as it almost seems to us, they're going in hundreds of different directions with their life. Someone may be going this way with their life. Someone may be going this way or this way or this way. And it seems to us that they're going in hundreds or thousands of different ways with their life. And yet Jesus said there's only two possible ways. There's only two possible paths that you can take in this life. There's only two. Right now at this very moment, every person on the face of this earth is on one of these two paths. This morning I want us to consider these two paths as we talk about this topic, that the ways of the Lord are right. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13, Jesus describes that first way. And for the purposes of this lesson, I just want to call it the ways of the world. You can call it the ways of sin, you can call it the ways of Satan, and all of those would be saying the same thing. But Jesus says there's two paths that you can go on, two ways that you can go in life. One way is that you can go down the ways of the world. I love how God describes this. If you want to see God's evaluation of what this way is like, He first of all says that this way is a way of folly. You read Proverbs, and, and over and over God talks about in that book the marks of fools, the marks of foolishness. And He says that those who go down this path, those who follow after the ways of the world, God says are following a path of folly. Are you on that path this morning? Are you following after the ways of the world? God says the end thereof is going to be even while you're on that path, it's going to be a place of folly. Because you see, if you're following the ways of the world, then you are one that is basing all of your decisions on human judgment. You're basing all of your decisions on your own human reasoning. In the book of Judges, you know Judges chapter 21 and verse 25, where the Bible says that in this time there was no king in Israel, Everyone did that which was right, where? In his own eyes. Man was deciding what man was going to do. In Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12, it says, There is a way that seems right to a man. When you follow after the ways of the world, you're following after your own desires. You're following after your own inclinations. You're following after your own wisdom. The Bible says that when you follow after your own desires, that it's going to give birth to sin in James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. You cannot walk after the ways of the world and avoid sin. You cannot walk after the ways of the world and not stumble because the ways of the world demand that you walk after your own judgment, your own faulty reasoning. And the one who leads you down that path is that great deceiver. You think about what Satan is able to do. Satan is able to take that which is so evil, so wicked, and so wrong, and he's able to make it look so good and look so right. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 says, that, 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 uh, that the devil can transform himself into an angel of light. And that his ministers, the next verse says, can turn themselves, transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. Here's the devil who we know wants us to spend all of eternity in hell, and yet he can transform himself into an angel of light and make all those things that are evil appear to be good. Back in the days of the prophets, there were those who were calling good evil and calling evil good, and I don't think much has changed. 
We live in a world where there are people calling that which is good evil and calling that which is evil good because they're following after and have been deceived by the guise of Satan. If you follow after the ways of the world, you're being deceived. The pleasure that you are being promised is only a temporary pleasure. Moses recognized that in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 25, that, this, that these pleasures of sin were merely passing, temporary pleasures, and not anything that would last. There are so many things that seem so appealing in this world. But yet, when you get over and you partake in what they have to offer, all of a sudden it's not what you expect. All of a sudden, that which you thought was going to be so great ends up being less than great. You've been deceived. Following after a path that cannot promise any kind of joy or pleasure that will last any longer than what would be temporary. And when you follow after the ways of the world, you become enslaved to them. Remember the story of David and Bathsheba? You remember how in that story, even as it were, seemingly in a short period of time, how David became enslaved to sin. He committed one sin, and in order to cover up that sin, he committed another sin. In order to cover up that sin, he committed another sin. In order to cover that up, and on and on and on, David went to the point where the tentacles of sin had wrapped themselves around David and had grabbed a hold of him, and David was serving sin. That's what can happen to us. We can become so enraptured with the things of the world that we will become a slave of the world. We'll become, we will become a slave of sin. And that's what Romans chapter 6 talks about. It's interesting that there are people that in the world who think, well, Christianity is, is where you get enslaved. Being a Christian is where you're, you're, you're living some kind of a strict life where you can't do this and you can't do that, all the while not realizing that they need to pick up a mirror and see that the ways of the world are what are enslaving. The ways of the world are addictive. Why do you think there are all of these different Alcoholics Anonymous and, and, and Drugs Anonymous and Gambling Anonymous and all of these things that are involved with trying to help people break addictions. I haven't heard of any Christians Anonymous, have you? You seen any groups trying to break Christians of, of their addictions? Perhaps it's because we're not addicted to Christ enough. The ways of the world are enslaving. They'll grab a hold of you and they won't let go. And if you do nothing in this life, if you do nothing in this life to escape them, the Bible says there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. Separation from God not only in this life, but you can be separated from God for all of eternity if you do not escape the ways of the world. As you think about these six points, as you think about God's evaluation, and that's what this is. This is the Scripture's evaluation of what the ways of the world have to offer. There's nothing here that I want. There's nothing here that I want for you. There's nothing here that's going to gain you an entrance into that everlasting kingdom. But for just a moment, if God's evaluation of the ways of the world is not enough. Could I ask you to honestly step back and ask yourself this morning, honestly, what is it that the world has to offer that God doesn't? What is there that I can, that I can have in the world that I can't have if I'm in Christ? What is there that could be afforded to me by following after the ways of the world that I can't have if I'm trying to follow after the ways of the Lord. And this list is not exhaustive, but I would suggest to you this morning that there are a lot of things in this world that you can have that you can't have in Christ. Are there any of these that might be appealing to us? Do you know that you can have these things right now in the world 
but not have them in the Lord? You know, if you follow after the paths of the world, you can have maliciousness in your life. You can have violence. You can have hatred. You can have envy. You can have jealousy. Oh, you, yeah, but, but you can't get that in Christ, can you? If you follow after the ways of the world, you can have lasciviousness. You can have sexual immorality. You can have adultery. You can have fornication. You can have lust. You can have pornography. You can have homosexuality. You can have all of these things if you'll just follow after the ways of the world. But you won't find them if you follow after the ways of the Lord. If you take an honest step backward and you begin seeing what this world has to offer, what is there on this list? that is so appealing? What is there on this list that makes us want to follow after this path? Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 16. The Bible says, here's what the wise man will do. The wise man fears and he departs from evil. I beg of you this morning, choose you this day, whom you will serve. I beg of you this morning to become that wise man who sees evil and doesn't linger around to see how close he can get to it, but fears and departs from evil. There's a, uh, I guess it's an invitation song that we sing that has a verse that says, This world has nothing left to give. Is that true? You follow after the ways of the world, and this world doesn't have anything left to give. It has no new, no pure delights. There's nothing in this world that you and I as Christians should want. I don't know about you, but that's enough for me to say, I don't want that. That's enough for me to say, that's not the path that I want. Let's talk about the path that Jesus talks about, the path that Hosea talks about. Let's consider what is involved with the ways of the Lord. And I want us to contrast, the reason I put this list back up, is I want you to contrast the ways of the world with the ways of the Lord. And while God looks at the ways of the world and says these ways are, are folly, Hosea says the ways of the Lord are right. They're right every time. In Psalm 18 and verse 30, the psalmist says that the way of the Lord is not just right, it's perfect. If you want to follow the path of God, if you want to follow after the path of the Lord, you can be right, you can become perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. Because you're not basing what you're doing upon some kind of human reasoning, you would be basing the path of your life on divine wisdom. Divine reasoning. Do you know the passage in Isaiah 55 and verses 8 and 9? If you don't know that passage, you need to underline it in your Bible and you need to write it on your hearts. Because there's, there's this tendency in our society today. There's this tendency to, for some reason to try to elevate ourselves, our finite human selves. There's a tendency to try to elevate ourselves to the position to, the, to be equal with God. And if not to do that, then to bring God down and bring Him down to our level. And yet in Isaiah 55 and verse 9, what does the Lord say? As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Folks, we need to know that. We need to recognize that our finite minds, our finite thoughts, and our finite ways cannot compare at all with the ways of the Lord. And if you'll follow after the path of God, if you'll follow after the ways of the Lord, you'll be following after divine wisdom, divine reasoning. You'll be following after godly desires. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 11, or verse 12, it says that if we're going to serve God, if we're going to partake of this grace that's talked about back up in verse 11, then we need to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. We need to get this out of our lives. Denying ungodliness and worldly lust that we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age. And that's where we need to be. 
making up our minds to turn our backs on the ways of the world and to turn and serve God, serving Him with godly desires and recognition that the ways of God will never deceive us. The ways of the world, in, 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 second, in second Peter chapter 2, they're, they're, like, they're like wells without water. You get over there and you want something to drink, and yet there's nothing there when you arrive. The ways of the Lord, you can trust them every time. Satan will tempt you. Satan will deceive you. And when that angel of light gets you over there, you'll recognize it's not light at all, it's darkness. He's changed, he's turned. But James chapter 1 and verse 17, the Bible says, We have a God in whom there is no variation. There is no shadow of turning. You can trust Him. He's not going to change. When God makes you a promise, when God tells you that if you do something, that you will have this reward, you can count on it every time. Ways of the Lord are, are a path that you can trust with your life because these are not momentary pleasures. These are not temporary pleasures that you have serving God. These are eternal pleasures. Jesus promised in John chapter 10 and verse 10 that those following after the ways of the Lord would have an abundant life. And that's not just an abundant life in heaven. That is an abundant life here on this earth. As you begin to look at your life, which path are you on? Are you following after the ways of the world? Or are you following after the ways of the, of the Lord? You see, you can be enslaved to sin. You can serve sin for the rest of your life. Or you can be freed from it. In Romans chapter 6, Beginning in verse 7 is where it first begins to talk about that idea of being freed from sin. And you get down in verses 17 and 18, and Paul says, God be thanked that though you were, past tense, though you were slaves of sin, though you used to be walking down the pathway and the ways of the world, though you were slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. You obeyed from the heart, you became a child of God. And now you've been freed from sin. That sin's been removed. You don't need to be enslaved to it any longer. You don't need to be addicted to it any longer. When you become a child of God, God with the blood of Jesus washes away every sin that you've ever committed. You don't have to have it anymore. You don't have to be enslaved to it ever again. You can turn from being a slave to Satan and turn and become a slave, a servant, a faithful servant of God. And the promise of God is that if you'll follow after the ways of the, world, uh, of the Lord, that you'll have everlasting life. That you will have the promise of an eternal dwelling place with God forever and ever. Choose you this day whom you will serve. If you were to back again, uh, uh, back, back away again and honestly evaluate, here's an honest, perhaps an honest evaluation of what the ways of the world have to offer. But suppose for a minute that you were to begin looking at faithful Christians that you've known in your life. Suppose you were to think about members of this church who have been members of this church or have been Christians for years and years. Are there any characteristics in their life that you would like to emulate? Are there any qualities in their life that you think are worthwhile having? You see, I look at the ways of the world and there's not any qualities, no characteristics, no lifestyle at all that I want. But I look at faithful Christians and there are qualities like love and joy and peace, long-suffering and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and self-control. And on and on and on this list could go of qualities that can become yours if you'll follow after the ways of the Lord. You see, when you begin to examine these two paths, whether you pick up your Bible and you look at God's evaluation or whether you take a step backward and you say, okay, what, if I were to put an honest man's cap on, what is an honest person's evaluation of these two lifestyles? 
What can I have if I follow after the world? And what kind of life can I have if I follow after the Lord? Folks, if for no other reason at all for serving God, I'd rather serve Him so that I can have this as a part of my life than to have any of these things in my life. Why does anybody want to have deceit and lying, filthy language, cruel jokes as a part of their life when they can have kindness and goodness and faithfulness? The ways of the Lord are right. They're not just right sometimes. The ways of the Lord are right all the time. In just the few minutes that we have left, I want to share with you four specific areas that we need to think about this morning in which the ways of the Lord are right and in which the ways of the Lord are always right. And as we consider these things, these are things that we need to have confidence in. These are things that we need to have absolute assurance of. We don't need to be ashamed of these things. We don't need to question these things at all. If the ways of the Lord are right, then the ways of the Lord are always right. And the first thing I want us to see is that they are right doctrinally. Do you believe that? Do you believe that the ways of the Lord are right doctrinally? When you pick up this book, how much of it do you trust? When you pick up this book, how much of it is right? When you pick up and read this book, how much of it do you question? When you pick up this book and you read through it, how much of it are you ashamed of to believe or to practice? Folks, we don't need to be ashamed of what's in this book. We don't need to question what's in this book. The ways of the Lord are right. They're right doctrinally. Every word of God is right. Therefore, when I pick up this book, and I read that he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. I don't need to question that at all. And I don't need to be ashamed of that at all. I pick up the Bible and the Bible says that the person who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And I understand that the ways of the Lord, not me, that's not my verse. That's not your verse. That's the God's verse. And God says, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And that's got to be right. Because the ways of the Lord are right. When I pick up the Bible and I read that there is one body, there's one church. That's not my verse. I didn't make that up. I don't need to question God saying there's one church at all. And I don't need to be ashamed to stand up for it and proclaim it because the ways of the Lord are right every time. The ways of the Lord are right doctrinally. When I pick up this book and I read and it says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, I don't need to be ashamed of that verse. I don't need to question that the New Testament teaches us to have as a part of our worship congregational singing. Singing without the accompaniment of instrument. And I know that because the ways of the Lord are right. Every time I read about music and New Testament worship, it's always singing. And I can with confidence say that the ways of the Lord are right doctrinally, and I need to know. I don't need to question them. I don't need to be ashamed of them. I need to be ready to stand up and to proclaim and defend the ways of God because that's the path that I'm trying to walk on. But the ways of the Lord are not just right doctrinally. The ways of the Lord are right morally. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs that every word of God is pure. And if you and I will take the pure words of God, and if we'll take those words and write them on our hearts, then we can fulfill the challenge that Paul gave to Timothy and we can keep ourselves pure. Because His words are pure, and His ways are right. His ways are right morally. So when I pick up this book, and when I read in this book that marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, 
I don't need to question what that verse means. I don't need to be ashamed of what that verse teaches. God created marriage. He created marriage for one man and for one woman to live together. And within that marriage relationship, God created an intimate act that that husband and that wife are to engage in only the two of them. That's why he says that bed in the marriage is undefiled. What does that say about a bed that's outside that marriage? What does that say about that intimate act happening before someone has the privilege of marriage? What does that say about that intimate act happening outside of that marriage bed? The ways of the Lord are right The rest of the verse not only says that marriage is honorable among all and the bed is undefiled, God goes on and says, but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. God's ways are right, morally. Young people, we need to understand, you need to understand that the ways of God, they're not up for debate. They're not up for speculation. The ways of the Lord are right. And they're right every time. And He's given to us these paths that He wants us to go down in life. We don't need to be ashamed that when Jesus says, if a man looks upon a woman to lust after her, he's already committed adultery with her in his heart. We need to understand that the ways of the Lord, that they're right. When we pick up the Bible and we read in, in, in Ephesians 5 and verse 18, do not get drunk with wine. I don't need to question that. And I don't need to be ashamed of that. I need to live a life of sobriety because that's what God calls upon me to live. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 4, he says to be sober, be free from the influence of intoxicants. Because he goes on the next verse and says, we are not of those of the night. We are not of those who get drunk and are drunk. We are those who are sober. We are free from any intoxicants. And I don't need to be ashamed to live that life. I don't need to be one who would question what God says on that because the ways of the Lord are right. They're right every time. They are right morally. The ways of the Lord, they're right practically. The Bible says that in this book, I have all things that pertain unto life and godliness. This book tells me how to live. It doesn't just tell me how to serve God. It doesn't just tell me how to worship. It doesn't just tell me how to organize the church. It doesn't just tell me how to be saved. This book tells me how to live every day. The ways of the Lord are right in a practical sense. What I mean by that, who would you rather have as a husband? Someone walking in the ways of the Lord or somebody walking in the ways of the world? Who would you rather have as a wife? Who would you rather have as a mother or a father? Someone walking in the ways of the Lord or somebody walking in the ways of the world? Who would you rather have as a neighbor? Who would you rather have as your boss? Who would you rather have as your employees? Who would you rather have as your closest friends? Those who are following after the ways of the Lord or those who are following after the ways of the world? In a practical sense. Following after the ways of the Lord impacts your life, makes you live a life that's not only pleasing to God, but a life that makes you a better citizen, a better husband, a better wife, a better parent, a better child, a better boss, a better worker, a better friend, a better neighbor. His ways are right doctrinally, they're right morally, they're right practically, and they are right eternally. God's ways are right and they'll always be right. His word endures forever. I don't know how many times I have heard this saying and perhaps you've heard it in some form or another. I'm sure that there are preachers that share this particular saying in many different places. But as we close this morning, as we contemplate the ways of the Lord, I'd like you to take this saying that I'm about to put on the screen, write it upon your heart, and live by it every day. Recognition that His ways are right, 
and that they're always right, consider this. It's always right to do right, without exception. It's always wrong to do wrong. It's never right to do wrong. And it's never wrong to do right. And that's right because the Bible is always right. The ways of God cannot be challenged. You can choose not to serve Him. You can choose this day whom you will serve and choose not to serve Him. But you'll be following after a path where the end thereof is death. If you're not a Christian this morning, if you're not walking in the ways of the Lord, you you can become a Christian this day by believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Believing that He came, that He died upon that cross as a perfect, sinless sacrifice. That He was raised from the dead. If you believe that with all of your heart, then that faith in your heart is going to cause you to want to turn away from the wrong and the sin and the ways of the world that are a part of your life. And that's what the Bible calls repentance. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, why don't you this morning repent? Make up your mind to turn away from sin, turn away from the ways of the world. Confess your faith this morning and this very day. Be baptized, immersed into water, baptized into Christ so that every one of your sins can be washed away. You think about the ways of the Lord. And if we were to come up with our own plan of salvation, it probably would have looked different than God's. But God didn't ask us to come up with our way to be saved. God showed us the way. His ways are right. It's up to us to submit to them and to obey them. If you're already a Christian, already a child of God, perhaps you've been walking after the ways of the, of the world and not after the ways of the Lord, you can come this day. The very last verse of the book of Hosea says, Who is wise? Let him understand these things. Who is prudent? Let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the righteous walk in them. Are you righteous? Are you walking after the ways of the Lord? If we can help you in any way this morning, please come as together we stand and sing.